Hello everyone and happy Thursday. Welcome back to the attic. It is a rainy and gloomy day here in South Bend. Uh, and I gotta be honest, Buddy and Truman have been napping all day and it's very hard to not just join them and, and uh, keep hitting the snooze button. But I'm also excited to be joined by our guest today, Cameron Esposito, who's a comedian, actress, uh, and author. Excited to talk to her about her book, her podcast, uh, and her stand-up. So let's go ahead and bring her in now. Hey. Yes. <laughs> How's it going? Well, that part is always impossible. That <laughs> beginning part, that's impossible. It makes Each me time. Stop. It's so uncomfortable, but then I watch other people's <laughs> live streams and sometimes they struggle with it like 10 times more. And, I'm, and it's like, it's painful for all of us. Yes, it is. Also, uh, you know, what a majestic miracle that it works at all. I can't right. believe it works at all. And that's why we're here, just to hang out with one another. And I'm very grateful that we have technology, so we can we can do that. And now we have, you know, 400 friends in a room with us, just just here to watch us talk like normal. That's right. Um, how are you today? I'm great. It is. Um, uh, well, I'm I'm great because I'm healthy and uh, I'm happy. But it is a gloomy, rainy day here. We had uh, some major thunderstorms this morning. We lost power for a little bit. Um, oh but wow. Just been cuddled up with the dogs all day. And I, of course, watched one of your stand-up specials this morning to prepare for this, so. Oh, I'm so glad you did. Just me and, and my and brand and, your, and the dogs and your stand-up special. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. Uh, what a dream for you. Um, <laughs> How are you I'm, doing? You look like you have more sun there. Yeah, so I'm, first of all, I, uh, I do get it. I, um, I'm from the Midwest. I don't know if you know that. I'm from Chicago originally. So I understand this weather that you're speaking of. Um, here in Los Angeles, it is sunny. I will also say that the street directly outside of my apartment um, is under construction. <laughs> and I recently found out for it will be going on for six months, which is a real quarantine dream. They are using a machine out there I've never seen before. It looks like a bread slicer, like from a bakery, but it's for slicing streets. So it's what? just, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's the loudest sound I've ever heard. Can you please it, document that? Yeah, um, I don't worry. I'll make <laughs> sure to, I mean, I, I also want to ask them, like, what skill is required to do this? Could I learn this skill? Can I um, hang out with you? <laughs> It just seems impressive. Uh, in they terms are, of... They're building a park. We live on a river. And so across the river, they're building this uh, new section of a park. And for weeks, they were using a pile driver. So about 8 a.m., we would just hear clang, clang, and all day. Like, all day. It was yeah. Awesome. I mean, I think that um, it has added some some special anxiety. However, something that's great about me is I actually, I don't even need help with anxiety. Like I can go ahead and manu manufacture that all by myself. I'm really good at it. Um, my, my girlfriend was sick for a bunch of weeks and her doctors thought likely with coronavirus and she's much better now. But my initial response the day that she got symptoms was that I panic bought a bidet immediately like i i started sleeping with a hatchet i don't know i don't know why i thought those things would be i mean she was getting like medical care elsewhere i'm not a doctor so that wasn't my job to provide but i thought for some reason That's that i should do something and that the things that i decided to do were very unhelpful like i can't even install a bidet i mailed it back but it did live here in my house for a period, period of time you, just, you held it you're like, you're a little bit i better. just needed to be like i have done something um so <laughs> I've yeah, I'm, this for you, should you need it. Yeah, this is this is for us. This is keeping the family safe, or at the very least, our butts will be safe. <laughs> when we went to a Costco, like the first week before everything got really serious and sucked up on a few things, they had an end cap of bidets. It was like what? The people, yeah, they. It's like the people at Costco thought ahead and they were like, "Well, if everyone's panic buying toilet paper." Let's bring in a pallet of bidets. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. They were out on Amazon also. I mean, this was, a, this was also at a time when it was a little bit, I'm, uh, it's difficult to figure out whether or not to buy things from Amazon right now. But at the time, yeah. when, like, when everything was first happening, it made sense to, um, do you remember how we all thought this was gonna be short for a moment? I, maybe I, you didn't. 
but I did. Um, <laughs> well, I was supposed. To, oh, go ahead. What were you saying? You're from the Midwest, so you understand how some people here think that it's just over as well. Like it's over now. Yes, actually, <laughs> if you would. Over. Yeah, another place where that seems to be happening that people think it's over is Los Angeles. Um, really? Well, because <laughs> um, our our like stay at home order was just extended indefinitely. It was supposed to be over this this week, um, but the beaches are now open, oh, no. and so it's it's like stay home as much as you possibly can. But also, if you absolutely need to work out, you can go outside. And um, I don't know if you know anything about Los Angeles, but it turns out. Every single person that lives in this city believes they need to work out. That's that might as well just be like an open invitation yeah. to leave your house. I, I'm really you know I'm struggling with it, and I and like my husband's downstairs. He's the politician. He's doing like the calls and the meetings and the you know committees and whatnot. And I'm you know I'm just sitting here watching folks make decisions and trying my best to be mindful of my words. Uh, yeah. but it is, it's, it's a struggle. Well, you also have a, a book coming out that you announced. <laughs> Let's just pivot to something. Else. Yeah. No, um, I, no, yeah. I, I, I was going to ask because, um, I also think it's a strange time for me. So I had a book, um, yeah, yeah, that well, is right it. here. It is called save yourself. Um, this is the name of a book that was released week one of a global pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> it's called Save Yourself. That had a, that title was in, was was supposed to be a pun about um, the fact that I was raised super Catholic and I um, was saving myself for marriage. Um, but then also when I when I realized I was queer, I um, pivoted and decided to save myself in other ways outside of my Catholic faith. But anyway, a book you could release right now would be called Save Yourself. That's one That's one option. I wonder if there are people who've ordered your book thinking it's like perhaps a survival guide. I mean, the good news is it's like definitely a lesbian holding a microphone on the front. So I don't, so anybody thinks this is a, that thinks this is a survival guide, <laughs> they might just be like, actually I do need a bidet and a hatchet. So like, I'll go to her. Um, but what if they but, didn't and then they like, you know, they get 10 pages in and they're like, Diane, it's about a lesbian. <laughs> well, you know what? Then good. Like, absolutely. I am very ready for straight folks to um, wander into our media because it turns out I have actually consumed a fair amount of media about straight people in my life. I think sometimes ah. when straight folks um, are wondering whether or not, is this book for me? Or like, is this movie for me? Well, I get it. I want to remind them like, you know, 90% of everything is straight. So yeah. you could try one book and see if you like it. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's all for you. Yeah, it's all for you. This is, we get this one thing. If you're a um, straight white man, it's for you. And it's yeah. all, it's been created for you. That's right. Uh, so well, I watched your special this morning. Uh, it's it's available on your website, and proceeds from that uh, go to Rain, which I really appreciate. And I think you do a really good job of diving into subject matter that invites people in in a way, sort of disarms them. And I mean, you're very good at, at poking at yourself and poking at humor. Um, but I really enjoyed the special um, because of that, because I think so many people are standoffish when it comes to those topics. And you just did an excellent job um, talking about sexual assault, talking about privilege. And I was wondering if you could just tell folks a little, just a little bit more about it. Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you for, that's such a, what a beautiful setup. Yeah. Um, you know, the results of the 2016 election um, were very personally upsetting to me because I felt that we absolutely knew um, who this person was before he was elected. It's, it's one thing to find out um, information over time. It's also, it's also, it's also something to disagree with somebody's record, to hold them um, accountable and to ask for what you personally want. Mm. Um, but, you know, when I heard, and I think that's good, you know, I think that like, I think disagreement across political discourse is positive, especially, you know, I would love for the Democratic Party to move further left 
And I think the way that we do that is by engaging in the process. Um, then there's a totally different thing, which is we heard the recording of a man saying that he sexually assaults women. Like we just heard that. We heard it from his, his own mouth. Right. Um, and then he was elected president. And, you know, for me, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. That, that felt, that was so tough. Um, and obviously we also heard him say things about um, undocumented immigrants. We also, I mean, we just heard, we heard all of his opinions, his personal right. opinions. Um, and so I, I kept thinking as a comic, you know, what could I do about this? And I thought that there might be nothing more impactful than telling my own personal story. Because it's one thing to to sort of to show up and like chastise somebody over and over again. And it's another to just be like, hey, this is what happened to me. Here's why I think it happened to me. And just expose folks to um, something they may not see. You know, specifically in stand-up, the topic of sexual assault come up, comes up all the time. And it's usually jokes that are they're like getting away with something or they're um, they're shocking because they like steal a laugh from you um, because you didn't know where the comic would go. But in my case, you know, I really thought uh, percentage wise, there are people in every audience who are survivors of sexual assault. There are people on every show who are survivors of sexual assault. And I thought, you know, doing an hour and it is called rape jokes, um, which I feel very proud of because that is a perennial topic in stand up. And, um, and my special is like the number one Google result in that area, which I just felt like was great. So instead of it being like a crappy joke that then a bunch of people had to write about why it was crappy, it's, um, it's an hour that's really personal and that I worked really hard on and that raised a bunch of money for um, the people who do the direct service work at Rain. So that's the largest sexual violence, anti-sexual violence organization in the country. And they pick up the phone lines when people call and say, I don't know what to do. I, well, one, I love that. Um, and I just, uh, again, uh, I, I see some folks in the comments asking where they can find it. It's up on your website, which I believe is just your name. Yeah, it's CameronEsposito.com, and I put it up um, on my website because it is free, and there is no paywall. So what happens is you can you can donate, um, but you can also just watch it. And and through donations, um, I raised $100,000, oh which God. is amazing because that means that that's just people who decided to donate. Um, and wow. and I, I just – it was important to me that it wasn't behind a paywall because there might be people who – need to hear about this topic because of their own lived experience. And I want it to be available to all. So again, CameronEsposito.com. And I see someone saying, I don't know how to laugh at that. And the answer is, you know, you don't have to make, um, there are no topics that are off limit limits in stand up. but the way to do it is you don't make the pain, the punchline, you know, there's nothing in the special. And of course, you know, you can choose what's right for you, but there's nothing in the special that um, makes fun of me for this happening to me. It, it more talks about culture. And um, if you just position the laughs at things that are not, that don't cause further harm, you can yeah. do it. You can talk about anything. And I really, really appreciate in the special how you called out other people um, for stealing laughs. Uh, yeah. Like that is so personal. Um, I myself am a survivor of sexual assault and really, really appreciated the way in which you talked about the subject in a way that I felt like I need other people to be in this room watching it because I need them to benefit from, from seeing this and benefit from thinking about the ways in which they talk about something that is really harmful, maybe even to people in their own lives and they, you know, they don't know. So I hope people will go check it out. And then I hope uh, other folks will check out your book as well. And I'm wondering for you, what was it like taking some of these stories, because you talk about growing up Catholic, I uh, grew up here in the Midwest. Um, what was it like putting that on the page for you? I know for me, <laughs> you know, I'm like, we're about to send this thing out into the world and I'm mm -hmm. absolutely terrified because I just, I wanted to be as vulnerable as possible, but you know, then you're, you're like, oh, these are all like my, these are like my truths and my vulnerabilities. And I don't know if people are gonna, you know, what was it like for you to just, send it out into the world. 
Yeah, that's such a good question. And that's part of why I wanted to talk about you have it, you, you're announcing your book this week too, um, because I just went through this whole thing. Um, you know, it's first of all, it's a, it is a fucking privilege to get to write a book. Um, so yeah. I just want to acknowledge that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But also, you know, I, I'm a comic first, like that's how I got my start. And then I also thought, I, for a very long time, I thought I would be too queer to make it elsewhere in the entertainment industry. Like when I moved to Los Angeles, it was because living in Chicago, I couldn't really make enough money to buy a couch doing stand-up. And I was like, there's got to be something more than this. Like, I like I really think I deserve a couch at this point. Um, <laughs> and so I, I moved to LA just thinking that there might be some a way to plug into um, getting jobs. And then I got out here and folks were like, actually, do you want to, um, you know, your, your, your point of view is so specific that have your, like, would you like to act? Would you like to, you know, create television shows? Um, and obviously I also work really hard. So it's not like I was just approached, but when the book happened, I was like, sure, a book, no problem. I talk about vulnerable things all the time. Actually, exact opposite. It is impossible because I'm used to stand up. You can always gauge the temperature of the room. Yeah. Um, you can undercut vulnerability by the release of a laugh for a book. It's just like, I was just alone in my house being like, well, <laughs> actually that's kind of how everything is now. Right. So right. Yeah. maybe it was just prep for this. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, um, well, one, I used to live in Chicago, too. And uh, the couch I had had, like, a hole in the end of one of the seats. So you could only sit on, you know, two of the couches. <laughs> Why is furniture so expensive in Chicago? Um, it's very expensive. Everywhere. <laughs> right. Yeah. Couches um, are expensive. When you're living in the city, it's like, what do I want? You know, do I want to, like, pay the internet bill this week? Or do I want to get a couch? Um, but I, you know, I talked to my mom for like an hour yesterday because I was so nervous like you know I it's not like I'm mean to my hometown uh because I love my hometown but I was so nervous about talking about all of the pain that I that I you know took with me when I left it and and the things that I experienced in high school and you get into that too uh and you went to a catholic high school um yeah. And I was really resonating on your special about like, no sex ed. Like, let's not, like, we're not going to talk about things that might be uncomfortable or taboo and stuff. And I was just like, like, just spitballing to my mom. Like, I'm really afraid. Like, I talk about, you know, conservatism and like Republicans and, you know, like the homophobia and the hatred and the misogyny. And um, I don't know. How do you feel? How do you feel like now that it's out in the world? Do you, do you feel like the weights kind of lifted off your shoulders? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th that's a great question. I think there's two different things going on there. One of them is there are the people who are characters in this book. Like, for instance, my first girlfriend is a big character in my book, and um, I cheated on her, and I talk about that in the book. And also, it's not something that she would have found out through the book, um, but it is something that I, like, I mailed her a manuscript ahead of time because I thought – how incredibly unfair if she just read it when it was released. Um, and, you know, there were a lot of reasons that that was the choice I made. I, when I came out, I was at a, I was a, at a conservative Catholic college where you could have been kicked out for being gay. I had no one else um, in my life that I knew that was an out queer person. So I, my first girlfriend was my family. And I just, after, um, after I no longer thought the relationship was working out, it felt impossible for me to end it because she was, mm. she was my whole access to the, to the queer world. So I just started like dating someone else and it was terrible. It was a terrible thing that I did and I have apologized for it, but sending her the manuscript was really amazing because she wrote me a really long email that said, you know, I know the stuff that happened in this. Um, like I, it was very painful and we've both grown a lot and I'm really happy that I went through the things that I did with you. I'm really glad it was you, which mm. it's like 20 years after that happening. I couldn't believe I received like essentially the email that was like, yo, we're actually cool. And I mean, she has her own life, you know, she's got kids right. and, and a wife. So 
it's not like I thought I was the center of her universe, yeah. but um, I feel like I got like like forgiven with a capital F for oh, one of the good. things I have felt the worst about. So I hope you have some wow. experience like that where, where something comes back to you that you didn't expect. There's been some catharsis. I'm still like a little nervous because I have, you know, it's, um, it's yeah. like not on the shelves. Yet. And I've had a lot of conversations like yeah. calling friends being like, I have rewritten this story a hundred times. And to the best of my ability, I believe this is true. Can I read this to you? Yeah. And like, will you tell me like, do you think that is the world that we grew up in? Or do you think like I was just a product of a very specific environment, right? Um, specifically talking mm. about racism, racist symbols, like the Confederate flag mm. growing up in Northern Michigan. And um, I was like, do you remember that? Do you like you, re you remember like no one talking about that? And like, you know, and, and just calling fr some friends like I haven't really talked to since high school, you know, we stay in touch, but it's very hard to to keep up with one another being like, do you remember being closeted in high school? Like, what did it feel like to you? Because to me, it was hell, you know, and just trying to gauge your experience with what that that was like. But yeah, I, I feel like in a way, it's been a little yeah. therapeutic, like, well, at least I'm just processing like all of these, all of these steps in life, and what they, you know, what they built, you know, led me to. You know, I, I like, first of all, <laughs> whenever it's a place like, I mean, number one, the Confederate flag. But um, yeah. always, when it's like a, always yeah. when it's a place like Northern Michigan or, um, for instance, rural Washington will have a lot of Confederate <laughs> flags. And I'm like, you know, not to um, not to name this so specifically, but this wasn't even yours. <laughs> so we know what this means. I mean, but yeah. anyway, uh, right. But I, I do want to say, you know, some of what I think you're talking about there is. So something I had a more complicated relationship with is, you know, I went to, I went to Boston College. It is a, it is a college that is, um, first of all, a rival of Notre Dame, which is right down the street from oh, yes. y'all. Yeah. And um, I think that because those schools have like a very, like they have a really good football program or they're in the, you know, the men's basketball team, uh, the men's basketball tournament. I think that we can forget how incredibly damaging um, religious fervor is to the queer community. Mm. I think a lot of times straight folks um, want to tell a story right now that we are at a different time in queer acceptance. And I, I feel called to always remind folks that you know, the Catholic Church specifically is an organization that is, you know, built on um, colonialism and built on misogyny. And um, it's also an organization that a lot of people turn to for beauty and faith. And I say this because for a long time, the Catholic Church really worked for me. But it is, but it is also where some of the most, the greatest harm was done to me because I was actually speaking with a theologian the other day who talked to me about harm that is done in the name of God and how mm. much more complicated that is. You know, it's one thing when your parents um, reject or have a difficult time with your coming out, which did happen in my case, and they have since come around on that 100%. But it's another thing when the school that you're at, the faith that you're at tells you that you are going to burn in actual literal hell, which is a place <laughs> right. um, because of who you are. Yeah. And, you know, so I wrote about that in this book, but it's scary to write about it because that's still how I was raised, mm -hmm. you know, and that's still the college I went to. That's still, I still, that's still where I have my college friends from, you know, it's, it's, we can't as queer folks, we can't erase our participation in the organizations that harm us because often those are the, the organizations, that's a culture we're born into. Right. You know, this is, this is also true of our country. Um, yeah. It's a lot to navigate, to, lo to love these places yeah. and to feel harmed by them. That, 
Yeah, that's um, that hits close, and you know it. This is why uh, you know I, I respect you because I think the more people are willing to be vulnerable and just share their absolute you know raw truth, like this is who I am and this is what happened to me, and I want you to know that not because you know I'm I'm upset with you or I believe you know you are a certain way. I just want you to understand like what happened to me because of it, and then maybe that will help you cross the bridge, you know, maybe, maybe it'll help kind of pull you over to the right side of history. Um, and I never want to be seen, you know, standing on a soapbox and waving my finger at someone because I don't think that's how you get people to join you. Um, but I think uh, like you, like you've done in your stand up and you do on your podcast uh, and your book, you know, if you just go out there and you say like, this is who I am, this is what happened. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. Uh, this is, this is real, you know, and it happens to countless, you know, people. I think it, it just helps shed a light on things that um, allow people to think for themselves in a way and think about and approach subjects that they are probably very uncomfortable hearing about or talking about, reading about. So, yeah, that's right. I mean, and as a stand-up comic, I have a little more bandwidth. So I get to, I get to <laughs> be, true. Yeah. have us have say stronger uh, things about it than you might, but I really, yeah, I hear you and I appreciate it's what you're saying. True. <laughs> <laughs> there were many times in the campaign trail, I was like, oh, there's a journalist. <laughs> Actually, <turning. laughs> I just have to say, so we shook hands That's in right. New Hampshire. Yeah. And I just want to say that, that this moment was so cute to me. So I, my girlfriend is from, um, my, my girlfriend is from like what I think of as rural New Hampshire and what she thinks of as Amherst, New Hampshire. <laughs> she was like, I'm from like a similar town to where you are. And it's, it's um, it's really a small town where she, where she's from, and yeah. the town next to that they had a big parade. Yeah, but I had never been to New Hampshire for the primary season, so I didn't know that like the smallest town in the world. It was you know um, it was like their local band, the dan the gymnastics team yeah. from the high school, and then like actual Bernie Sanders. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> Massive street teams for every for every candidate and then you were there um you know acting as a surrogate for your husband and you were on the other side of the street but I had like a flat brimmed hat on and I'm just going to say you don't know that this happened but I had like I mean I looked um as gay as I always do and I like I like I I gave you I gave you I gave you a a gay gaze a gaze yep. and I <laughs> I absolutely mesmerized you so that you came over and shook my hand because you were on the other side of the street. But I said, once I sort of put out the vibe, yeah. he will come and shake my hand. I believe that he will be able to understand yeah. that was that us queers. Yeah, I remember that vividly. Um, <laughs> and that was an interesting parade because like, you know, Bernie's in front of me and you're like, I don't know this town. I don't know how this town is going to receive any of us. Um, sure. I'm being mindful of like not pissing off the Bernie people in front of me and not like encroaching on whatever candidates behind, you know, like we're all staying in our bubbles and we're being respectful. And, uh, you know, you're just supposed to do like retail politics. And I'm like running up to people and be like, hi, I'm Chastin Buttigieg. Uh, my husband's running for president. I hope you can count on your vote. Like one, what a weird thing to do in general. And then like multiple times in that parade, um, I got some pretty nasty words thrown at me. Like people like recoiled their hands, be like, hey, my husband's running for president. And, they, and they'd, they'd be like, oh, no, you know, like get off our lawn. And, uh, and then I remember coming into, coming into town and then I remember uh, you were there and it was like, oh, hello fellow gay. Like, it's, <laughs> like you would not believe the blocks I've walked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I have to say, um... Yeah, that was something else for me too. I mean, it it, it is pretty. Look, I I understand some portion of what it is like to walk out and have folks not know what to make of you, or have folks be cruel. The largest audience I've ever bombed in front of is um, thirty thousand people, so. If 30,000 people are not laughing at your jokes because like, and you know, as a comic, you know when it's because you're queer 
Um, like I absolutely know. I can see the looks on the face. Um, but, um, you know, I guess I just say like, this is part of the whole thing. And I just saw somebody say, um, I just saw somebody say that it wasn't homophobia. It's, it, it was Pete's platform. And I guess I would just say like, obviously I don't want to speak in your this is not even in your defense. I think that there's a couple, I think there's a couple, you know, there can always be multiple things going on. One is like, of course, we should always ask for politicians to um, be more representative of our values. I absolutely think that is true. And anybody who um, has spoken that in the last uh, primary, and I'm like, I'm grateful to you. And I hope that you'll continue to speak your truth. Um especially young people. Um, and I also think that we can acknowledge that homophobia is real. Yeah. And both things are true. Yeah. I, for some reason, I didn't see any of the other um, spouses being denied handshakes. You know, it's not like anyone's like, <laughs> I, wish, I wish you'd go further on Medicare for all, but nice to see you. You know, it was just like, <laughs> I'm not, right? Like, yeah. I'm, like I'm icky. I'm going to give you, you know, some sort of virus um, just by shaking your hand. That's called homophobia. That's not... You know, I've, I've encountered multiple people respectfully on the trail who were like, oh, I, you know, I really wish your husband would consider this or that. They can shake hands. Um, well, yeah. I mean, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like so, I totally hear you. It's so complicated to try to figure out. I mean, I will say I feel this, especially as a queer person, and um, that I think that like we do have a huge responsibility to our community. And it is really hard sometimes to live up to that. Yeah. I feel that as a human too. Like I just, I mean, I mean, I don't even know if that's what you're saying, but I will just say for me, I feel that it's a huge responsibility to live up to our community. And um, I know I could always do better. And it's, it's so, yeah, it's so tough to figure out how to do enough sometimes. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, was getting a lot of feedback, um, but you know, almost every day I was in a different state or a different city, like going to the LGBTQ centers and like trying to meet with as many people as possible and like sitting down and like listening to people and trying to just, you know, figure out like, who am I supposed to be? Like who, like what is needed from me in this capacity other than like showing up, right? Like first you have to show up and then you have to listen. Um, right. But even if like, even if you're doing as much as you possibly can, um, there are still going to be things that, um, you know, you are neither not accepted for, um, looked down upon for, um, or, you know, just simply not enough. But I think, uh, luckily you and I get more time to talk about this because I'm going to come on your podcast. That's right. You'll be on my podcast. And this was a, a real pleasure. And I think that, um, it's, it seems like from the comments that, uh, your husband is currently doing a live yeah, that we are competing with. Really bad. He's literally like right below. My <laughs> <laughs> Yo, walk into that. You know, I want then. Then you hold up the phone, and then we're all doing an inception. Um, I don't. Anyway. I think he's like doing a live with a, a senator or you know someone. Like, did you guys there want is, to talk about queer identity or like? I was just gonna say, there is absolutely no reason I couldn't tell. Do like a tight five of jokes in the background. <laughs> like, turn the volume up. Get me in there. I'll oh, I'll, I'll kill. <laughs> and right now, that's the word people want to hear in political discourse. I'll kill. They love to hear that. That's right now. That's the number <laughs> like, one thing people want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> can you just not use that word? But it's a comedy word. Jessica, can you please Nothing, anything else. <laughs> um, we are going to talk more about this. And yeah. uh, I appreciate your time today. Hey, it was fantastic. I hope people check out your special on your website, CameronEsposito.com. Your podcast query is wonderful. Check out your book. And I can't wait to catch up with you more uh, on your podcast. Yeah, we're going to get into it. All right. Thanks so much. Sounds really good. appreciate you. Talk See to you soon. You. All right. Thank you, Cameron. And thank you, uh, everybody, for tuning in. I know some of you uh, are probably running over to see Pete talk about uh, national service, I believe, is the topic uh, of the day. Uh, Cameron, again, really appreciate you. I hope folks check out her website, CameronEsposito.com. Um, check out that special. Uh, it meant it meant a lot to me, and I think it might mean a lot uh, to people in your life. Um, one, to see someone so vulnerable talking about something so personal, uh, but also just because we all deserve a good laugh uh, right now. Continue taking care of yourselves, and I will see you next week. Be well. <laughs>